Hello everybody, welcome back to Gruesome's Garage. I wanted to do um, a little video on this car. And I know a lot of you have probably seen it in the background of the other videos. I have mentioned it in a couple of the videos. Um, I always refer to it as a Hudson Terror Plane. Technically that's not correct. It's a, just a Terror Plane. They were made by Hudson Motor Company. But in 1936, this car was just referred to as a Terror Plane. It was its own separate line of automobiles. So, get that out of the way. Now, give you a little bit of a history of Hudson Motor Company and the car. You're all familiar with Hudson and the Hudson Hornet, I'm sure. But a lot of people don't know that, you know, before the Hornet, Hudson was around since 1909. And contrary to popular belief, they weren't named after the explorer Henry Hudson. They were named after J.L. Hudson of Hudson's department store in Detroit, uh, Michigan. He was the guy that gave the um, Howard Coffin and Ray D. Chaplin the money to basically start up Hudson Motor Company. So then his honor, they named the company after him. Now, a lot of, a lot of people don't know a lot about pre-war Hudsons. And unfortunately, our automotive press, especially when it comes to classic cars, when any pre-war, they're more concerned with Ford, Chevy, some of the higher-end independents like Packard, Cord, Studebaker, I mean not Studebaker, Auburn, um, you know, higher-end cars, Pierce Arrow. So, and not a lot really is known about Hudson, and it's a shame, because Hudson, Studebaker, Nash, they all contributed a lot to our modern automobiles. There's different innovations they came up with that they're on cars we use every day. So, I'm going to give you a little overview of Hudson. Now, Hudson was an engineering company. And one of the best examples of that, in 1916, Hudson came up with the first counterbalance crankshaft in an automobile engine. This was called the uh, Super 6. You may have heard that term, the Hudson Super 6. Now, 
they figured out by counterbalancing the crankshaft they could take out a lot of the vibration out of the crank, make it uh, stronger, make the motor able to rev quicker and easier, and it changed the way motors are built. And the car was put into uh, the Hudson Super 6, which quickly became known as the Mile a Minute Roadster because of the new crankshaft, it could sustain 60 miles an hour, which in 1916 was a big feat. In the 20s, Hudson came up with a companion car line called Essex. Now, Essex's big claim to fame is in 1921-22, they come out with a low-cost, closed-body car. Now, prior to that, if you wanted an enclosed car for all weather protection, you had to have it built by a custom coach builder. Most of the manufacturers did offer them, but they were more money than um, a standard um, car, an open car. Uh, Ford would be a good example of that. You wanted a closed Model T, it was a premium over the open car. So a lot of people didn't buy them. So Hudson, with the Essex line, came out with a low-cost, closed-body car, and they took off like crazy. I mean, people were like could have all weather protection, and you know, for a low cost. So it kind of forced the other companies to follow suit, and it actually caused convertibles and open air cars to become more expensive because of being less demand for them. They freed up the assembly lines for closed body vehicles. Now the twenties were really good to Hudson Motor Company. In 1929, they were the third selling automobile maker in the country. For a, a small independent like Hudson, that's a big feat. They were behind Ford and Chevrolet. And when you considered that you still had the big three back then, you had Chrysler, um, Ford, General Motors, you had a bunch of various independent car makers, there was just a ton of them. That was a big feat for Hudson to do that. But unfortunately, that was the last time they did something like that. The Depression was not kind to Hudson. When the Depression hit, people, being money being tight, they wanted low-priced cars. Your Fords, your Chevrolets, and your Plymouths, which were kind of new on the scene. So that caused a lot of the independent companies to look for a low-cost alternative to bring people into the showrooms to keep the company afloat. Hudson was no different. They knew they needed to do something, so they started looking at a lower cost alternative to even the Essex to compete directly with Ford and Chevrolet. Now, in 1932, the Ford V8 came out, and it was a, you know, milestone car. For the first time, you could get a low-priced car that was relatively fast. I mean, Ford went from having like a 45, 50 horsepower flathead to an 80 horsepower V8, and it quickly gained reputation for performance. Hudson saw that, and they said, well, we can do that game too. So they designed the new Terraplane to be small, light, it was smaller than the Essex, but they shoehorned the same flathead six in there. It gave the car an excellent power to rate ratio, and even though it was a flathead six, it was relatively comparable to the Ford V8. Now, Hudson figuring, you know, too much of a good thing is never enough. <laughs> they ended up coming out with the Terraplane, Essex Terraplane 8, 1933. What they did was they took their eight-cylinder flathead engine, which was a straight eight, and they shoehorned it into the light Terraplane body. And it was an instant factory hot rod. Overnight, it became probably one of the fastest cars on the planet. I mean, in order to beat it, you had to have like a Duesenberg or something really high-end. So popular with the car was for people that went fast, John Dillinger t used it as his getaway car. It actually was his favorite getaway car. So, Terraplane was doing well, kind of saved the company, but it was also being a victim of its own success. Hudson noticed right away it was taking sales away from the senior, senior Hudsons. The Terraplane 8 was priced around $600, where a comparable Hudson 8 would have been around a $900,000, which was a big price gap in the 1930s, especially with the economic hard times. So, they dropped the Terraplane 8. It was a one-year-only car. And in 1934, uh, they just went with ter Terraplane. They dropped the Essex moniker. So, 
they went on for a couple more years until they got to 1936, and that's when this car was built. Now, Terraplane did have a couple innovations. One, um, in 1935, they were the first car with an all-steel roof. Now, this car has an all-steel roof. The 35, if you've ever seen a 30s car, if you go to a car show, they never had stamping uh, machines big enough to stamp out these roofs in one piece. So what they used to do was there was a hole, and they would put a fabric cloth insert over that, and they would dope it up so it was weather tight. Now, Hudson got wind that General Motors was coming out with an all-new turret top. So to beat them to the punch for this all-steel top, Hudson took that insert out and welded in a steel piece, making an all-steel roof so they could claim that. Now, when 36 came along, by that time, Bud, who supplied Hudson with their bodies, they had a stamping machine big enough to stamp out this roof one-piece steel. So this is the first year of a one-piece steel roof. This car was also the first Hudson um, to have hydraulic brakes, which was a big innovation in the 30s. There were a few car companies that did have them. Now, one of the funny stories about this car is the chief engineer of Hudson at the time was test driving the prototype with the new hydraulic brake system on it. Brake line blew. Back then there was no backup system. Got into a car accident, broke his pelvis. That time that was a major injury, so he was in the hospital recuperating for like a month. Laying in the hospital bed, he asked a nurse to get him a notepad and a pencil, and he sketched up a backup brake system for these cars. So this car has a mechanical backup system in addition to the hydraulics. So if a line blows, something like that happens, you still have brakes. Now, they do work. I had the master cylinder in this car quit on me one time, and I was able to limp it home with just the hydraulic backup system, or the mechanical backup system. So it does work. Now, another thing they did was the, um, and I got it in another video with the interior, the Bendix electric hand. Basically, it was a pre-selector shifter, and with proper voodoo and an optional automatic clutch, very close to an automatic transmission. Um, so Hudson, like I said, they were doing well with the Terraplane line, but the car was also still a victim of its own success. In 1936, Terraplane had their best-selling year ever, and a lot of that was at the expense of the senior Hudson line. And I think a bell went off in Hudson headquarters where somebody decided, are we going to be the Hudson Motor Car Company or are we going to be the Terraplane Motor Car Company? And unfortunately, the Terraplane lost out. In 1937, the car became Terraplane with Hudson underneath the name underlying it. In 1938, it became just the Hudson Terraplane. Now you're going to ask, well, why they just did it continue it as the Hudson Terraplane? Well, Hudson in 1938 also brought out their own low-priced car. It was called the 112. It had a smaller engine than the Terraplane, a little bit shorter wheelbase, and it was lower priced. So after 1938, the Terraplane was discontinued altogether, and the 110 or the 112 soldiered on. So that was the end of the Terraplane. Now, this particular car, it's been in my family since 1978. My dad and I got it in a barn in Elbridge, New York, and, and we hauled it home in August. Now, the same day that my dad had gone to look at this car, I accompanied him, and we had looked at a 1953 Studebaker Starlight Coupe. My dad was a car guy, and growing up in the early 50s, if you've ever seen a 53 Stud Starlight Coupe, that was a milestone car, and he wanted one. But his 11-year-old son saw this thing sitting in that barn in Elbridge, six layers of paint showing through, because it had been painted numerous times, covered with tarps, bird poop all over it. I fell in love with this car. Love at first sight. I don't know what it was. Just the looks of it, the design of it, everything. It was just, it has like an Art Deco look to it, and I love Art Deco. So I begged and begged and begged him to buy this car, and he finally did. And it was his first full-on restoration. He'd had um, a 1949 
Ford Club Coupe in the early 70s and a 37 Plymouth. He bought those. They were both running cars at the time, and he um, did various, um, you know, just small things to them. But this was his first full-on restoration, and it was also the first car I ever worked on. Now, I had worked on mini bikes, snowmobiles. I had built, like, wooden go carts to race down hills. But I had never really had my hands on a car. So this was kind of a little bit of a father-son project. I started working with him, sanding the paint off it, doing little small mechanical things on it to help him out. And it really gave me a love of working on automobiles. And it gave me a love of old cars, uh, Hudson's in particular. I have a fondness for this brand. So later on, my dad, after we restored it, my dad was like Jay Leno. He did trailer cars. We ended up driving this to um, the Hudson guys, Essex Terraplane Club, which was the club, it still is for Hudson Auto Build Automobiles, had a national meet. And every year they'd hold it in a different city. So we drove this car the first time in 1980 to Baltimore, Maryland, from Syracuse, New York. That's quite a trip. And back. Well, the next year, the national meet was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We mapped it out. It was 940 miles one way. So we prepped the car, packed up our coolers, and we drove this thing through Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Indiana, up into Illinois, into Wisconsin, and ended up um, going to that meet. We won the Long Distance Award for Terraplane that year. Every year the club gave it out. Made the National Hudson Magazine. I still got that magazine, and we drove it back without incident. Um, unfortunately, the next time he took it to a national, by then I was a teenager. I was into muscle cars and really had no interest in going on that kind of a trip, and I regret it. But um, my dad died in 1990. Uh, there was no will, so the car was in kind of a limbo. It was sat up in a uh, garage at his house for a couple of years. And I kept begging his wife to sell it to me. And she finally did sell it to me. And, you know, I've had it since. It was 1993. It's, my kids grew up with this car. I've had it in weddings for people. Um, we've never taken it on any other state trips, but I used to drive it up to Northville, New York, which is up in the Adirondack Mountains from here. There was a guy I knew in the Hudson Club. Uh, Larry Kramer would have a show up there every year. And it was a nice little jaunt for us. And it's just, you know, uh, this car is, I had it out today. It's, it needs a little work. Obviously, you can see it needs to be repainted. My dad used lacquer paint because it was his first time he ever painted a car, a complete car. And they didn't have the, um, you know, the kind of primer they have now. You have uh, ceiling primers. You have etching primers. They didn't have that back then. So after... Probably 12, 13 years, the paint started to crack, and then it started peeling off, and it's peeling off in quite a few places, so it needs to be repainted. I also need to change these quarter windows and back. Unfortunately, i got to take the... This upholstery is all original in this car, other than the seat covers, which underneath these seat covers my dad put on in 1978, the original mohair upholstery is still on this car. So, you know, that was, he didn't need to touch the interior. It was in good shape. Mechanically, it's been it was rebuilt. The motor, the tranny, I had a new wet clutch put into it. Um, went through the brakes, suspension. So, but this is my 1936 Terraplane. Um, if you want to see a video of me driving the car, there's an older one on my page. Sound quality kind of stinks, but I didn't have a great camera back then, and you know, gives you a little bit of an idea of the car going down the road. But it's really you know what more can i say i love the car i've kicked around selling it a few times it's it's not a not a friendly car to drive on modern roads i mean it's geared low it's got a low revving six in it um it will go down the road 55 60 if i pushed it but i'm winding that motor so bad and you're talking a flathead six with poured baffet bearings with a three inch bore and a five inch stroke i don't want to put a rod through the block so I don't rub it that high. I mean, it's 85 years old. So I keep it 45, 50, and you get people tailgating you and stuff. So I, I try to keep it on the back roads now. But 
uh, I just could never bring my, I don't know, I can't bring myself to get rid of it. I mean, it's just, it's so much a part of me now. Like I said, it's, you know, it's been in my family 44 years. You know, I, I you know, been around this car since I was a kid. My kids have been around it since they were kids. So, and my granddaughter sat in this car. I don't take her for a ride in it because there, there's no seat belts in it. But, um, maybe someday, if you're a little older, you can go for a ride in it. But, thank you for watching the video. If you would, please hit the like and subscribe button. Um, I hope you enjoyed the little talk about the car. I took some pictures of it. Um, I'll give you a little rundown of how the electric hand worked. A uh, little video of driving away stuff. So, have a great day. God bless. Till next time.